Is the recording ready? It's yeah. running. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. So, um, all right, let's get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, by the way, you could see my presentation in my slides, right? This is uh, not present. This is the presenter mode. Yeah. Okay, great. Perfect. Okay, so before we get started, I just want to mention that I, in the chat, I put the link for the slides, um, the PDF for the slides in the chat. So feel free to grab them there. Uh, I'll be I'll be leading the next session. My name is Coriosis. I'm a postdoc here at Duke, um, and this is session three, which will run from 1:30 to 3 p.m. Um, and we'll be discussing how to calculate and analyze thermodynamics of materials. Um, this will focus on the convex hull analysis, uh, which I helped develop, and then we'll talk about an important correction for polar materials, which was uh, primarily developed by uh, Dr. Rico Friedrich. Uh, all right, so the main question for, for this session that I want you to keep in mind is, will we want to ask the question, will a material form? This is a question of whether the material is synthesizable. There are two domains of interest that we, sh that, that we need to consider. Um, regarding whether whether a material is going to form, um, and that includes uh, the kinetic. Let me get my laser pointer. Uh, the kinetic control and thermodynamic control. Now, both controls are important um, in terms of dictating whether a material is going to form. But let's talk about the difference between the two. Here we have uh, uh, two component, two materials, two different components. We have uh, pure bu uh, blue atoms here and pure white atoms just for two arbitrary materials and they're gonna to mix together. Um, and then we can follow the reaction um, uh, as, as it goes from the reactants to the products. So you'll see that there's two possible outcomes, product one and product two. And here we have this y-axis is, um, is the energy. Um, and so if we are under um, kinetic control, um, you imagine that the reaction is running at a certain temperature and so that, that quantifies to some extent the maximum energy of the system. And so if, uh, if, the, uh, if, the if, the, if the reactants cannot go above the energy um, dictated by the temperature of the, of the environment, then you'll see that uh, product one is gonna form, whereas product two, you'll see that it, require, it, it goes through an intermediate state, which is high, requires more energy. And so this is an inaccessible product. So we'll see that if, if the materials under kinetic control, we're really going to see product one, um, although it is higher in energy than product two because of this uh, transition state. Um, if, we, if we focus on thermodynamic control, then we ignore the transition state and we only look at the difference in energy between the reactants and the products. And so in which case we sort of obscure our view of, of the intermediate reaction. Um, and we just look at the reactants in the product. And so product two is lower in energy than product one. So we, we will form product two. So this is the thermodynamic control. Both are, are important, um, but we're really gonna focus in on, 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 uh, on looking at analyzing the thermodynamics of the system. This is the tendency of where uh, the reactants want to go eventually. Um, uh, you know, if we have, we allow for infinite time and and um, and we have a uh, we're allowed to explore all possible states. This is really the thermodynamic control. So we're going to ignore the kinetic um, uh, variables for now for this for this discussion. Okay, so question of whether we have thermodynamic stability. So here we have a mixture of palladium and platinum. So we have a mixture of blue and white atoms, and we want to ask the question: Is this material stable? or is it gonna to wanna to decompose into its pure components, uh, pure uh, palladium and pure platinum, okay? You can think of this as, as wanting to mix oil and vinegar when you create a salad dressing. Um, this is dictated by the energetics of the system. So um, the thermodynamic potential of interest is the Gibbs free energy. Um, the primary reason is because we can control the temperature and pressure in the experiment. So this is, this is the, the thermodynamic potential of, of, of interest. There are going to be two, there's two, roughly speaking, there's two variables of interest here. There's H here, which is the enthalpy of the system. You can think of this as sort of the order in the system. And then there's a second term, which is uh, going to vary with temperature. And this is the, this is the disorder. Well, it's going to be, it's going to be scaled by the temperature, but this is, this is the entropy of the system. And this quantifies the entropy of the system. 
So there's, there's these two components, these two components to the, to the energy of the system, and they're, 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 they're sort of at conflict, okay? So depending on how much order we have in the system, that's going to quantify whether we want, whether the energy of the system goes in one direction or how much entropy in the system, how much temperature is going to be driving up that reaction. So um, the, the second law of thermodynamics dictates that we want to minimize the Gibbs free energy. Okay, so to minim so so the, the the system is is intrinsically lazy, so it wants to minimize the energy. It's going to pick the path of least resistance. One way of doing that, or or corollary to, to that, is we want to maximize the entropy. Okay, so you can see how those two two concepts are equivalent from the equation. Um, we're going to for the for the focus of this talk, we're going to hone in on on just talking about the enthalpy of the system, the ordering of the system, that that component of of this equation, we're gonna we're not going to incorporate disorder, so we're just going to focus on the enthalpy. So, how do we calculate the enthalpy of a material? Um, well, enthalpy has two parts. It has the internal energy of the of the material, and then we have this pressure volume term. We're going to ignore pressure volume. We're just going to focus in on on the internal energy of the material, and it and and we can we can sort of break it up into into various components. Um, we can look at the energy that comes with uh, each individual atom. Okay, so, so the blue atoms carry a particular energy, the white atoms carry another energy. We can look at the energy from the interactions between blue and white atoms, between white and white atoms, between blue and blue atoms. Um, and so that's gonna depend, of course, on the distance between these atoms. So where they're positioned, um, so roughly speaking, how they're bonded. Um, we can also talk about third order terms. So now angle between bo uh, uh, three bonded atoms is going to become important in, in those sort of concepts. So you can go on and on and on in this sort of Taylor expansion. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, um, the calculating the enthalpy is going to require uh, um, a, a density functional theory calculation. Um, you can treat this as a black box. So assuming that we've specified the way that the atoms are arranged and what atoms we have, the fact that we have platinum and, plate and palladium, we can specify our, we have, we've sort of specified the parameters for the calculation. And so that, that structure, if we pass it through this black box of density functional theory, which considers the electrons and, and the wave functions, then we can calculate the enthalpy of the material. Okay, so we, 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 we just, we take a material as an input and then as out, output from density functional theory, we get the energy, we get the enthalpy. So we get a, we're going to get an enthalpy for the, uh, the mixture, the 50-50 mixture we have here. We can get an enthalpy for the pure components individually. So pure palladium, pure platinum, um, and we're going to calculate what's called the, the, the enthalpy of formation. Okay, so we're basically going to zero out the enthalpies of, of the pure components. So, so, so pure palladium and pure platinum, we're going to zero out these, these, uh, these we're going to subtract off the, the, the energies of the pure components to get the enthalpy of formation of the mixture. Okay, so it's, it's calculated as the enthalpy of, uh, uh, of the mixture minus the stoichiometric weighted uh, sum of the two pure components, the enthalpies of the two pure components. Okay, so this is the enthalpy of formation. You can think of it as, as offsetting the, the, the enthalpy from the pure components. Pictorially, I think it becomes more obvious. So here we have the, the you can think of this as the energy axis. This is the, the enthalpy of the system. This is the one axis. And then we have on the x-axis, we have the full range of stoichiometries here. So we have pure palladium and pure platinum here. Um, and so by, 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 by calculating the formation enthalpy, we basically zeroed out the, 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 the enthalpies of the pure components. So they sit right along the, the x-axis, the zero line here. And then we have the enthalpy formation of our mixture here, okay? so. If we want to ask the question, is the mixture going to be more stable than the pure components? Um, this is a question of whether the mixture has lower energy than that of the pure components. And so visually becomes very obvious here. We just look at whether the mixture has a lower energy. If it's lower than the tie line, 
connecting that of the pure the, connecting the pure components. Okay, so the fact that this 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 uh, the the mixture is lower than the tie line tells us that it's stable to decomposition um, to its pure components. Okay, so pictorially, that's that's pretty simple. Now, we we cannot just consider decomposition into its pure components. There's a lot of different decompositions that are possible. So we have the pure components at the edges here, but we also have a lot of different ways of mixing palladium and platinum. So we can have um, we can have different ratios of blue to white atoms. Okay, so here we have PD3, PT. So we're gonna have we have a particular ratio of blue to white atoms there. We can have PD, PT7 where we have more uh, more of one than the other, and, and another case of that. We can also have here we have our 50-50 mixture, which is what I've been showing you um, throughout the slides, but there's also different ways of arranging it. So we have all these, we can also have polymorphs, those are polymorphs. So we have all of these different structures that we have to consider, both varying composition and also the way that we arrange the atoms. And we need to consider all of the possible decompositions that are possible. Um, and so you can see here that we're gonna consider all the different tie lines and we wanna, we wanna find out what are the most stable points that are not going to decompose into any other combination in this picture? This analysis is called the convex hull. Okay, it's a generic, it's a general mathematical co construct. Basically, we want to find the most outside points of the data set. You can roughly think of this as taking a giant rubber band and wrapping it around the data. The points that the rubber band is going to touch are going to be the most stable points. You can see here that any one of these decompositions, there's no, uh, there are no points below these tie lines. Okay, so they make up the most stable points. Okay, so this is called a tie line here. This tie line here, um, it's, we, it's defined uh, between two stable points in this convex hull. And so what does this mean physically? Well, it means that these two, these two uh, compounds, PDPT and PDPT3, happily coexist. So if we take those two components and we try to mix them together, they're going to want to stay phase separated and they're happy to stay phase separated. Uh, on the other hand, if we look at another point that is off the hall, so it's going to be above these tie lines, uh, this, this point, this compound here, PD2PT3, if we try to mix... The, the components together in that, in, that, uh, in that ratio, that system is unstable. And so it's going to decompose into a linear combination or, or it's gonna decompose into these two uh, compounds here. So you can see that um, the decomposition reaction is entirely given by this picture. So here we have our, our uh, PD2, PT3 mixture and it's going to phase separate the decomposition reaction is dictated by these two components here. So what we do is we, for any given unstable uh, compound, we take our eyes from that compound and we just drop our eyes straight down to the tie line directly below it. And that's going to dictate what the decomposition reaction is. And the, the coefficients here are dictated by chemistry, just balancing out the, the, the relative amounts of, of each component. So, the, the line itself tells us where we go, what, what, how, we, how we create this decomposition reaction, but that distance energetically is also very important. It also tells us the, 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 um, the tendency to want to form the products of the decomposition reaction. So how much is it, uh, how you can think of it roughly speaking is how fast it's gonna wanna decompose, but what is, what is the driving force for that reaction? So this distance here is small, it's three MeV per atom. Small, we roughly define as, we have a criteria which we, we use um, and it's, a, it's, it's 25 MeV, which is the, uh, the room temperature excitations, the, the excitations at room temperature. So if we plug in um, room temperature, 300 Kelvin, we're gonna get about 25 MeV. So as long as the distances are within 25 MeV, we say that the distance is pretty small. Why is this important? Because you have to remember that these calculations are performed at zero temperature. We're not considering this order. 
um, and there's no pressure. Okay, so as we incorporate, as we as we vary the temperature and pressure, this picture is going to change. The energy landscape is going to change, and so you know, of course, we want to make predictions at least at room temperature. Maybe we're doing high temperature, high pressure uh, uh, experiments, but if we're focused at room temperature, then we know that there's some error associated with this picture. Um, and that error can be as large, roughly speaking, as 25 MeV. So keep that, that, that idea in mind. Um, so we have, we've, we've implemented this, uh, this analysis into A-flow. Um, here are just some technical details that, are, that, that, that you might want to consider um, that are sort of done automatically by the, by the analysis in A-flow. Um, you might have outlier data among our, our calculations. So in this case, you can see here that we have, we have the majority of the data existing really within this range here. And then we might have, an, it, we might have a, a, a particular compound that is really far removed from the rest of the data set. You can see how this is going to skew our results. Why, do we, why might there exist an outlier? Because maybe this calculation was performed with different parameters. Maybe it didn't fully relax. We've done, we've done a lot of tests. We do a lot of cleaning in the AFL database, but in general, um, for any given data set, maybe from other databases, this, this, is, this is fully possible. So we, do, we, we, we automatically do a calculation of, of outliers and we remove them uh, uh, in the AF, with the AFL software. Uh, we also have, um, we pull data from, from, from other databases that include the inorganic crystallographic structure database. And in this database, there are a lot of duplicate entries. And so we using uh, the crystal match software, the, the crystal finder software that, that, that uh, Dr. Hicks discussed earlier, we can actually analyze which structures are unique and, and focus in on those unique structures. Okay, so we're gonna have basically for any given point, we can have uh, uh, duplicate data um, and we want to know that if we want analysis of, of which structures lie in the convex hull, we want, we want to just have the unique ones. So we do that analysis and we provide which ones are degenerate structurally. Um, all right, so we're going we're gonna to play with this module online. We're going we're gonna to look at, at we, we've created a, an online module for the convex hull analysis and we're, we're going to play with it online together. So I'm going to ask that with our browser, we're going to, uh, to go to... I'm going to stop sharing this and I'm going to share my full screen. Okay, desktop one. And we're going to go to uh, AFLOW.org. Okay, so we're going to type in, oh, I'll do it with you. We're going to go to AFLOW.org. Let me put, you guys can see my screen, right? I just want some, some verification that you should see my full screen. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go to AFLOW.org. Um, and we're going to scroll down and we're going to go to the convex hall uh, analysis. And I'm gonna, we're going to pick out a particular convex hall. So we're going to look at a ternary phase diagram. So before we were looking at binaries. So we had the tie line and then we had uh, all of the, we basically had, uh, um, we had our tie lines. So we had our energy axis and then we had our composition space here. We can, we can add additional components. So we're going to look at a ternary phase diagram. So here, we're going to have uh, our, our, our three components instead of two. And then the energy axis is, 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 is visualized here in terms of colors. To visualize this better, let's go to the app. So we're going to type in as an example. We're going to go to the, uh, the silver gold cadmium system. So if you type that in. You're going to get a visualization like this. And so you can see here how we have basically um, along our X, Y plane, we're going to have our composition space. So we have silver, pure silver, pure, pure gold, pure um, cadmium here. And then our Z axis is going to be the energy um, axis, the formation enthalpy axis. So you can actually click here and you can zoom in and you can actually analyze what the minimum energy surface looks like. Okay. So um, we did we did this analysis for unstable points. We sh I showed you how you can visually just drop your eyes and look at the, the points here. So I'm going to do the same 
with with the ternary uh, phase diagram here. So I'm going to you, you see here that I clicked on this point here and it shows you the tie line that it corresponds to. So here, this point here sits right above the tie line formed by these two phases here. OK, so we can see visually what that decomposition looks like. We can also have one second. Let me see if I can find one. That course, yes. So we can also have one that sits above the tie surface where it's going to decompose into three components. Okay, so you can now that we're increasing dimensionality, you can have decompositions that where, where you're going to decompose into three different components, you can decompose into two different components. Okay, and so you can you can imagine how we as we add components, though we, we're going to get more and more different ways that we can decompose our system. Okay, so that that's what that visualization looks like there. Um, there's a number of components to look at here, so we can highlight our hull points here. So we just look at the points that define the, the convex hull here. Um, I'm going to click on a particular point here, all right, and then I'm going to highlight that point and click on it. And it's going to take you to a separate screen where you get information just about that particular compound. Okay, so we get the prototype label, we get some symmetry information some information about the energy, the density. If we want more information about this system, we also get information from the convex hull. You click on more info, and that's gonna take you to the entry page, which gives you the full breakdown of that compound. I right? think of this as kind of the Facebook page for the material here. Okay, so we get the, an illustration, and then we get all the data for that, that material here. Okay, so let's go back. To our, um, to our convex hull. I'm going to click on selected hull here at the top. All right, and that brings us back to our page here. Uh, if we click on download PDF, it's going to download uh, uh, a snapshot, a report of that, of that convex hull analysis. So here we get basically the top, the top visualization of, of this convex hull where um, we see that with color, we highlight the depth, okay? So this, this, uh, this report gives us an illustration at the top, and then we get all the information. Let me zoom in here. I'm going to make this bigger. We get a lot of information about the, um, uh, the, the, the various compounds that were used to construct the convex, so all the different calculations. And it's sorted by, so at the top, we have ternaries, then we have the binary systems, and then the unary. So the three components, then the two components, and the one components. Um, so this, 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 this stoichiometry here, you can see here that it's written as, as unstable. Um, if we click here, this is going to give us the entry page for that compound. So I'm just going to go back just to show you what that does there. Um, that's a link there. We get some information about the compound. We get the, the A-flow ID, unique ID. We get space group information, spin, the enthalpy of formation. Uh, don't worry about the entropic temperature here. It's another parameter that, that, that's relevant to, the, to, to uh, stability analysis. And then we get the distance to the hull. Okay, so it's, it's 162. So that's how high from the convex hull that compound sits. Because it's unstable, we're going to get. It's going to also provide us with the decomposition reaction. Okay, you'll notice that these are links, so it'll actually take us to the relevant part of the of the of the report, what it's going to decompose into. This stoichiometry. This is a ground state structure, so it actually sits on the convex hull. It's this compound here. Um, it sits on the convex hull. You'll see that highlighted in green is the entry that defines that convex hull. Um, we have some, some additional uh, descriptors that we've created. This is called a stability criterion uh, weight, because I'm going to explain what that is in a few slides. But this, this delta SC is the stability criterion. And this is called the N plus 1 enthalpy energy. OK, so, so this, this is specified here. OK. I'll talk about what those are in the upcoming slides, but they sit right here in the, in, the, in the PDF. You'll notice that some of the compounds here are highlighted in orange. What that means is that they have the same relaxed space group as the compound that sits on the convex hull. So structurally, there's some similarity there. Um, here we have uh, the various 
um, the various uh, compounds that touch that com that po that compound on the on the convex hull. So what does that mean? If you look at this um, at this compound which sits on the convex hull, what those vertices specify is what are the various uh, triangles, the various uh, uh, triangles that form, so that touch that compound. So we get a specification of the of this triangle, the, the edges of this triangle. We get a specification of this triangle, of this triangle. So understanding the topology uh, of the convex hull, that's what these vertices give you here. And I'll explain in, a, in, in another slide why, why understanding this has been useful for materials discovery. So uh, this is a working document. I already showed you what some of these links do. You also have links embedded in the illustration here. So you can click on this point and it'll bring you to that relevant part of the PDF. Okay, so there's, there's really a lot of embedded links here. It's a working document uh, for, you be, for you to be able to use. All right, so I did a lot of explaining of the, of the app and the online data there. We're gonna go back to um, sharing the slides. So I'm going to talk about some of these different uh, descriptors. Okay. All right. So I talked about um, the, the vertices, right? So why do we want to understand the vertices and the topology of, of the convex hull? So uh, one of the materials that we've studied are called super alloys. Cormac referred to this earlier in the introduction. Um, but one of the way with super alloys, and I mean, they, they're, the, why they're so special is because they operate very well at high temperatures. They have very nice mechanical properties, very nice chemical properties like oxidation resistance. So they have to operate under these extreme, uh, uh, extreme conditions. One of the ways that they're made to be so hard is called uh, the age hardening procedure. And so this is a particular temperature treatment of the material. So we have here we have aluminum copper. You can see here that we basically have an aluminum matrix, so an aluminum material, and there's 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 kind of there's in, embedded in the aluminum matrix we have copper atoms scattered about. Okay, so with a particular temperature treatment, which includes annealing and 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 quenching, we can actually get uh, what's called precipitates. So this is kind of a secondary phase among the original FCC aluminum lattice uh, matrix. We can get, um, you can think of a, a, this phase as kind of forming, these precipitates forming in the material. These precipitates are not going to allow the materials to slide past each other, which prohibits pl plasticity of the material, and it's what creates the hardness. So we were looking at, uh, we were focusing on a particular type of super alloy composition, which can sit along this, this composition, this, this tie line here, okay? So um, if we want to know whether the material is going to be, if, if it's going to form, we want to make sure that the precipitate is in equilibrium with the host matrix, host matrix, right? Because they, 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 they have to be in equilibrium with each other. They have to be, they have to happily coexist. So the host matrix is, is, uh, is, is going to sit up here, right? It's kind of the pure aluminum host matrix. Um, and so we want to make sure that our compound, if it sits along this tie line here, if it's if it's if it sits at this particular composition, um, and this this green uh, this green tie line does not exist, then you can see how uh, it's it can be in it, it can ex it can be in two phase equilibrium with the the composition of interest. However, if the composition sits here and we have this tie line here, then there's not going to be a tie line that connects a composition here with the, with the host matrix. And so it's not going to be stable. Okay, so you can see how we can use the topology as a descriptor for finding super alloys, right, where this precipitate is allowed to form and coexist with uh, the host matrix. Uh, the stability criterion. So that was that delta SC parameter that I specified in the PDF. What is the stability criterion? Well, um, for, for stable compounds that define the convex hull, we want to um, get an understanding of how stable are these materials. Okay, so remember that the idea here is that this picture of the convex hull, it's not going to be perfect at, let's say, room temperature because we're doing our calculations at zero temperature. 
So we want to understand what is, and, and of course, we've only explored, we built this convex hull based on calculations that are stored in the AFLOW database. There are, of course, could exist a, calc, a, 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 a structure or, or a material that we haven't calculated um, that might change the which points are going to be stable. So we want to we want to get a, we want to kind of address the question: How stable are the stable points on the convex hull? One way of doing this is that for this PDPT uh, compound, we're going to remove the compound from the convex hull, recalculate uh, the pseudo hull here. So what is the convex hull? What does it look like if we remove this compound and calculate the new distance between the pseudo hull and the real convex hull? And in a sense, that gives you that you can imagine that if that distance is very large, then there, it's going to be very hard to find the comp. It's going to be increasingly harder to find the compound that's going to offset it and, and, and basically form a, a, a convex hole without that point. OK, so you can see here that the stability criteria in this distance here for this compound is, very, is pretty small. It's 6 MeV per atom. OK, let me check how I'm doing on time. Um, we use the stability criterion um, to, uh, to, to, we looked at, at a particular type of, of, of material that's called the Hoistler structure. So the Hoistler structure, there's actually three different variants. There's the full Hoistler, the inverse Hoistler, and the half Hoistler. So there's three different arrangements of atoms that we can have. And then we can populate these three structures with, with, with what we did in our studies. We populated them with combinations of, of three elements among these 51 different elements from the periodic table. So this makes an enormous number of different materials, over 200,000 different candidates. Um, of these 200 different candidates, of these 200 different candidates, uh, we looked at, uh, we looked at um, which were going to be um, magnetic, which were gonna be ground state. But one of the filtering criteria that we chose is the stability criterion where we, we ask the question, is this the stability criterion greater than 30 MeV? That 30 MeV being higher than the 25 MeV cutoff where we, 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 we associate between large and small. So we, we were able to whittle down our candidates to, well, in the study, we had four different candidates that we looked at. And of these four different candidates, we tried to form we, we went to, we asked the experimenters to try to make these materials and of these four, two actually formed um, and, and, and they were magnetic systems and so, as we predicted. So here's, here's the data for one of these magnetic systems, um, cobalt, manganese, titanium. And we were able actually in the study, we show that we were able to actually calculate the, the, uh, the, trans, the Curie temperature, which is the transition temperature between magnetic and, 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 and basically non-magnetic with temperature. We actually predicted the Curie temperature very well. Uh, what is this N plus one energy gain parameter that I talked about, that second parameter in the PDF? Um, well, okay, so here's this picture that, that I showed earlier where we have we show what the enthalpy of formation is and how it's defined for this, for this mixture here. Um, this distance here, this is the enthalpy of formation, but another way of thinking about it is that it's also the energy gained from going from a one component system or a linear combination of one component systems, one component systems to, to now a mixture of two component systems. So this distance or this energy is, is, a, is an energy gain from going from one to two components. Okay, and so you can see here that I'm now looking, I can look at this for any arbitrary binary compound. So I can look at mixtures of palladium platinum or manganese titanium, look at all the compounds that form there and look at whether there's an energy gained from going from the pure components to now a binary mixture. We can do this analysis for ternary systems. So we can ask, is there gonna be an energy gained from going from now three components, go, rather from going from one or two components to now three components. So we can look at all ternary combinations there. And we, we did a histogram over all of the data in the AFLOW database for metals. We looked at what are the enthalpy gains? Here's the histogram distribution for it. And you can see that there's some trends that form. So the red are, the all of the energy gains for the binary systems 
Um, so from going from one component to two, the green are the ternary systems. So is there an energy gain in forming a ternary system versus the binary and ternary decompositions that are possible? And then the blue are the, are the quaternary systems. So you can see that um, as we increase dimensionality, the enthalpy gain shrinks, and there's also fewer compounds that show any enthalpy gain. Okay, and this really comes down to uh, an understanding of how the convex hull is constructed. The convex hull, as you increase dimensionality, as you add more and more components, there's going to be more and more competition for stability. So the, so the ternary is made up of the three different binaries that you can get, you know, A, B, B, C, and A, C. So these are the, the, the convex hulls for the binaries. So here we have this convex hull. Here we have another convex hull and another convex hull. If we want to have a ternary that's stable, it has to not only be stable to other ternary systems, but also the binaries that it's formed from. Okay, so the competition increases with dimensionality, and that's what that's that's uh, um, that's what we can see from that analysis of of of, uh, of the AFLO database. So we can we get a better understanding of 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 how stability works as you increase the number of components. I'm just going to advertise here. We're not going to do it, but for those of you um, that are interested in working with the AFLO software, you can actually download the data. And you can work with it just as we were working on with it in the uh, in the web page. You can actually run these commands on your on your laptop if you download the software. So the software is going to go in and grab the data from our APIs, download it, and perform the analysis right there on your laptop. So here are some of the commands you have them in your PDF um, that you can use um, if you're interested in downloading the software. Um, there's also Python wrappers. For those of you that are interested in working with Python wrappers, you don't have to work with the binary. You can actually work with Python wrappers and integrate that data into your scripts and, and workflows. Um, we also have Jupyter Notebooks. For those of you that are interested in working with Jupyter Notebooks, we also have, uh, AFLO can also create a Jupyter Notebook and you can work with the data inside of the Jupyter Notebook. So uh, I'm going to um, I'm going to stop sharing here because now we have a few exercises to go through. Um, I'll give you a few minutes to do so. Let me share my full screen. Okay. So uh, using the web module, um, so you're going to come out here. You Basically, you can come out and you can go to the periodic table. Um, I want you to answer a number of questions. Um, we'll take about five minutes and then I'll, I'll, I'll go through the exercise. We'll go through the exercises together, but here are the, here are the questions that you should answer. Um, what is the distance of, of this compound from the convex hull? So you're going to want to find the convex hull made of aluminum and cobalt, find that compound and figure out what is the distance of that compound from the hull. Uh, what is the stability criterion for, for, for this compound here? on the TEZR com, uh, convex hull. What is the energy of the convex hull of the uh, uh, CUZR convex hull, the copper zirconium convex hull at the 0.5 composition? And then what is the compound, sorry, what is the ternary compound that has the highest stability criterion on the manganese palladium platinum hull? Okay, so if you guys have questions, feel free to post them in the chat. I'll have the chat open. Oh, it looks like there's a, oh, okay. There's a good question from, from Petra. Does this include a random solid solution in, this cal in the calculation? No. Um, so I told you earlier that this analysis ignores disorder. So a random solid solutions are disordered systems. Um, we're not gonna be able to go over uh, um, disordered systems in, in today because we just don't have enough time. But we do have an analysis for disordered systems. If someone could put, put on, and, and we have, we've done this presentation before, so we have some recordings online. If somebody can put up the, um, the, the seminars page, sorry, the, the, the AFLO school page, and you can see um, the PowerPoint for disordered materials and how we model that um, and how we model stability of disordered systems. Thank you, Marco, for doing that. So it's called the AFLO POC module for partial occupation systems which are random alloys. Okay, so I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Feel free to keep posting questions if you have them. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, and, and we'll, we'll go, we'll, we'll pick it up in a few minutes.
All right, let's walk through the exercises together and let's see if you were able to find the results you're looking for. So, all right, so the first question um, requires that we pull up the aluminum cobalt uh, convex hull. So we'll type in ALCO in the, in the search box. I think the easiest way to do this is to download the PDF. So I pull up the PDF here and then I look for that composition in the report. So we're looking for 17 and 12, which is near, it's approaching 50-50. Okay, here's the compound. Okay, it's unstable. So we're looking for what the distance to the hull is. The answer is 243 MeV per atom. Um, and, uh, and so that's a pretty large distance. So it's, it's very unstable. Okay, uh, the next question requires that we pull up the TEZR convex hull. We wanna know what the stability criterion is for that compound. So I pull up the PDF and I'm looking for TE2ZR. So it's right here. I can click on that. And the stability criterion for that compound is 49 MeV per atom. So that's pretty large. It means it's a pretty stable point. Okay, the next question requires that we pull up the to use it R uh, convex hull. All right, this one I'm gonna use the picture for. Um, what is the energy of the hull at, around, at about 0.5? So you can see here that at the 50-50 concentration, we actually don't have uh, a point on the convex hull. So by eye, um, we can see we can actually um, we can look at what the what the formation enthalpy is at around 50-50. If we want to zoom in, I can actually put zero here, and I can put in minus 200 here. Okay, so you can see that the 50-50 concentration, the convex hull is around 100 and minus 160 MeV per atom. Okay, so that's where the convex hull sits. If you want to zoom in, otherwise you're able to ballpark it and say around two, around two minus 200 MeV per atom. Uh, the last question is uh, requires us to pull up the MNPDPT hull. And uh, we want to know which 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 compound has the highest stability criterion. So we download the PDF. I open it up, and the ternaries are listed right at the top. So we can see that the first ternary that has a ground state, there's a stability criterion that's 33 MeV per atom. There's another one that has one that's one MeV per atom, and that's it. Those are the two stable uh, uh, compounds. Um, so the highest, the, the, the ternary compound that has the highest stability criteria is MN2PDPT. This is actually the composition of one of the magnets that we discovered um, in that study that I referenced earlier. So you can see that it has a stability criterion greater than 30 MeV per atom, which is that threshold we set higher than the, than the room temperature excitations. Okay, so let's pick it up. Um, we're going to, to continue with uh, the presentation. By the way, uh, um, thank you, Cormac, for posting the um, publications for the disordered, um, with, for, for our publication where we, we, we show how to analyze the, the, the thermodynamics and stability of, of uh, the disordered systems. And another publication we did on, on studying the transition temperature using uh, what's called the LTVC method for random alloys. Okay. So let's pick it up with presentation. All right, let me pull up the chat. So uh, we're going to talk about a very important correction for polar materials. 
um, which is going to be our coordination corrected enthalpies uh, uh, module um, or our, our approach. And then there's a corresponding module on AFLA. But first, what, why do we need these corrections and where does it apply? So these, these are for, um, for ionic or polar materials, which, are, which basically is a mixture of, of uh, uh, compounds of elements with, with, with uh, metals and non-metals. Okay, so they're highlighted in blue. So we have a, a compound that is a mixture of the blue and the green, then we, we form a polar material, okay? Um, so our corrections are gonna be very important for these types of materials. Let me get the laser pointer. Um, Application-wise, polar materials are, are everywhere. Um, they, 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 they drive uh, batteries. They're on, they, they, they actually, they, they're, they're important for glasses. So, so the, the glass that forms the, the surface of our phones or our, our, our monitors here that we're looking at the presentation through. Um, polar materials are very important in the aerospace um, industry. Um, and also for coatings of, of tools. Okay, so Cormac talked a little bit about this um, earlier. So these, 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 these uh, applications, the, we, the, to calculate stability, we would require um, some sort of correction for, for the analysis that we've been discussing um, in this presentation. So where, where does this correction apply? Well, it's really in terms of defining what that formation enthalpy is. Okay, so... I showed you earlier what this, this equation for the formation enthalpy is made of. We have the enthalpy of the compound and we subtract off the enthalpies of the constituents, the constituent elements. We're gonna have problems um, because DFT is, has a certain accuracy. Um, and, and basically the, when, we're, when we're doing the formation enthalpies of metals, the, there's, there's certain errors that end up canceling in this, in this, uh, in this subtraction here. Okay, so there are errors in the in the calculation of the enthalpy. There's error of the compound. There's errors in the calculation of the individual the enthalpies of the individual components, and they cancel out for metals. But when you have a compound that's formed up of metal of the compound of the constituents of an element, I'm oh, sorry, of a, of a metal and a non-metal, like in oxides, where we're going to have a, a metal component and then the reference for for the oxide is going to be the oxygen molecule um we're going to have we're not going to have this subtraction of errors um and so the compound um you can another way of looking at this is if you sort of analyze the charge distribution metals right metals have this 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 characteristic c of electrons whereas the the ionic materials the really you're really going to have localization of charge so the difference in characteristics of the electronics of these materials, it's going to render it very difficult to reduce to, to, to cancel out the errors in DFT. So we're going to have to apply corrections in calculating the formation enthalpies. Um, for metals, um, we have we really have a, a good way of getting um, sort of the triad of, of what we're looking for in terms of calculation uh, of, of, of these of these materials. We want calculations that are fast so that they're high throughput that they're accurate and that they're from first principles. Okay, and so, so semi-local DFT satisfies those three constraints. But for polar materials, um, we didn't really have a method for all three of these. Okay, so if we want something that's fast and first principle or ab initio, we might rely on DFT, but we're missing the accurate piece, right? There's some errors that don't cancel there. Um, if we want something that's accurate in first principle, we might rely on um, uh, EXX RPA, which stands for non self consistent ex exact exchange plus random phase approximation. So, this is going to be very expensive, um, a very expensive calculation. If we want that third piece, which is high throughput and accurate, then we, we're going to rely on this, um, this correction scheme that we've created in AFLOW. Um, and it's a pretty simple concept. So, we want to we want to perform corrections that are based on the coordination of the atoms in the material. So here we have a uh, uh, CaO, calcium oxide, and you can see that the, the, the local atomic environment involves a calcium atom in the middle and it's going to be coordinated with six oxygen um, atoms around it. So it's gonna form this, this, uh, this polyhedron here, which is based on six bonds to, to six, six oxygen atoms. In the rutile phase of titanium oxide, we're going to have uh, titanium surrounded by six oxygen atoms. 
we look at calcium titanium oxide, um, we're going to have a different coordination, right? So we're going to have the titanium atoms are surrounded by six oxygen bonds, but the calcium ions are going to be surrounded by eight oxygen bonds. Okay, so we're going to make corrections that are based on the different coordinations that are possible for the cations surrounded by the, 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 the particular anion, which in this case are the oxides. Um, so how do we form these corrections? Well, we look at the differences between the enthalpies of formation from experiment versus what's calculated from DFT, and we associate corrections with the, um, the stoichiometry of the cation, the number of bonds associated with that particular uh, um, cation, and we, and, and we build off the correction based on those two primers. So stoichiometry uh, um, and uh, the number of, of, of bonds. We can take that correction and we can apply it to ternaries, quaternaries, et cetera, um, by, by subtracting off the, the, the correction based on that particular cation in that particular oxidation state, okay, where the oxidation state is dictated by the, the, the coordination. So basically, we have a correction scheme that's defined for our particular species. So lithium, beryllium, we have it for a bunch of different uh, cations. And then we have it based on oxidation state, which is really defined by the, con uh, the coordination or the local atomic environment. How many different oxygen atoms is it, is it uh, um, uh, coordinated with? Okay, so we define corrections based off of this coordination picture that we have. Um, and that will allow us to rectify the enthalpy of formation. Okay, so we can include, um, we can actually do, we, ha we have two different types of, of, um, of we're gonna have, base we, we can specify the corrections um, at different temperatures. So we can do it at room temperature, right? But where the experiments are done. So this is where we have our, our exp experimental data of formation enthalpies. So basically we can fit our um, our data to those experimental uh, um, those experimental results, and we can get the room temperature corrections. But we can, if we want to calculate the the formation enthalpies at zero temperature, which is how we build the convex hull, we basically need to incorporate the thermal contributions um, to the corrections. Okay, so these temperature effects are calculated for each compound. And then they're subtracted off for the for each correction, and then we can get the zero temperature corrections. Okay, and so all of this has been done um, and tabulated for the various compounds that we have in AFLO. Um, we want to we want to test and see um, whether this whether how well this this method performs. And basically, we took our corrections, our fitted corrections from the binaries, and we applied them to ternary oxides. And you can see here that we, 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 we compare our correction scheme with what's called the, the Ferre approach, which is the fitted elemental phase um, reference energies. This approach basically defines a, a, a correction based on just the elements, not the coordination scheme. And you can see here that we get, we get a big gain um, in the overall um, error of, of, uh, of our formation enthalpies with respect to experiment. Um, this idea doesn't just apply to oxides. It, we've also tested it for halide, halide systems. Um, and you can see here that th these are just preliminary uh, data here that we show from our publication. But, but you can see here that the, that the CC corrections are really going to move uh, the formation enthalpies much closer to what we expect to, with, res with respect to experiment. Um, and another very important feature about this is that not only are we getting better, um, a better enthalpies of formation with respect to experiment, but that the ordering of the phases is going to be better. So which phase um, is going to be the ground state? Well, this, it, you know, we, if, if we have, if you have a big enough error, then you can actually calculate the wrong ground state. So it's not just a matter that everything is shifted, but things are shifted differently. Each compound, each of the compounds are shifted differently. So by, by applying corrections specific to the coordination, we can actually uh, we can actually rectify which system is the right ground state system. And so here we show various 
um, various systems that that are actually, if you do the calculations for PBE um, for using just normal DFT, you're actually going to get the wrong ground state. And then we, if we, we apply the corrections to, of, of our scheme here, we're going to get the right ground state system. Let me see how I'm doing on time. Okay. Keep going. All right. Um, and, and using this correction scheme, um, we can also get a pretty good estimation of what the formation enthalpy should be for the system. That's what the CC um, at experiment is. That I'm gonna, we're gonna focus a little bit more of this in the exercises, but based on the correction schemes, we can actually calculate what the formation enthalpy is it, it to, within, to, a, to a certain amount of error. So about within 250 MeV per atom. So we, even if you don't have the DFT formation enthalpies, you can actually resolve to within some error what the formation enthalpy should be using this correction scheme. Okay. So. All right, so this, this uh, we, we can interact with this. We can actually get the corrections for, for various structures using uh, an online interface. Um, and, and so let's, let's go ahead and, and, and play with it together. So I'm going to close out here and I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to share my full screen. I'm going to close out the convex hall here and we're just going to go to aflow.org and we're going to go to aflow online. Okay. So uh, on the slides, if you downloaded the PDF, you're going to get a structure on the next slide. You should be able to copy that struct that that the contents of that and paste it into into the AFO online port portal here. Okay. So if you scroll down, you should see that we have a section for our, our CCE corrections. We're going to activate it and we're going to calculate it for all functionals. And we're going to hit submit. Okay, so you're going to see what the output of the module is. So uh, first and foremost, the module needs to determine automatically what the oxidation um, states are of, of the anions and uh, of the cations, of, well, of both. So the first, the, so what it tells you first is it, it tells you the coordination, right, of of the magnesium uh, anion, uh, cations with the oxygen anion. So the coordination number is six. And from there, this, the, the, this, the, this module is going to calculate what the oxidation state is based on the coordination and the stoichiometry. So here you can see that it calculates that um, well, oxygen is going to be minus two and ma ma magnesium is going to be plus two. And then we get the corrections. Um, we get two sets of corrections, right? One at room temperature and then one at zero temperature where the thermal contributions have been, have been subtracted off. And we get the correction per cell and then per atom. Per atom is really the most important here. So we get it for the, uh, the PBE functional, we get it for the LDA functional, and then we get it for scan. Okay, so these are different functionals. These are different approximations of, um, of the exchange correlation functional term and density functional theory. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about, about those specifications, um, but basically the corrections have to be defined for the different approximations of that term and density functional theory. And then the CC, without specifying what the DFT calculated formation enthalpy is, we can get an estimate, an estimate of it from CCE. Okay, so we can get the formation enthalpy of what we expect just from CCE. Okay, and it even tells you, it gives you a little warning here that these, these are not necessarily going to be very accurate, but it's an approximation. Okay. Um, all right. So we've gone through that. Uh, in the slides, we're not, we're not really, we're not, I'm not going to talk about it very much, but if you download our software, you can interact with this module just as you are here through the web, mod, through the web module. You can interact with the CC module through Aflow. Using, uh, using the commands that are specified in the following slides. So here we can get information about uh, how to use the CC module. Um, you can get information about how to interact with the module through, through the AFO software. You're gonna get back the same data that you got here in the web module here. Um, and how to, how to play with the various inputs. So 
uh, one thing I didn't talk about is that you can actually, so if you have, uh, let's say you took the structure and you ran it with density functional theory, you're gonna get the, you're gonna get the enthalpies of formation um, for this structure. You can provide that as an input to CC and it's going to give you back the corrected formation enthalpies for you, okay? So not only are you gonna get the corrections um, that have to be subtracted off from the formation enthalpy, but actually the corrected formation enthalpy as well. So you can provide that as an input here and also as an input to the program uh, as specified here. And you can do it for various functional, so you can specify that. So all that's there too. If the algorithm, um, let's say you want to do it for a particular oxidation number, you can also specify the uh, oxidation numbers for the cations and the anions respectively um, as an input to the program. Okay. So uh, with that, we have a few exercises. Um, I'll give you uh, about five minutes to run through the exercises, and then we'll come together and we'll, we'll do them together. So um, let's see. So what are the exercises here? So the first exercise says, what are the oxidation numbers that the algorithm gives you for this structure right here? And then compare that to what you would expect. Okay, so the structure is provided on the next slide in order of the, of the questions. Okay, so um, that's question one. Question two says, which functional has the largest CC correction for this structure here at room temperature? Okay, so that's the second slide of structures there. And then for the third, third question, um, what are the corrected formation enthalpies um, for the perovskite structure at zero Kelvin? And so it gives you, we, we're gonna use the third structure, the last slide. Um, and we have the formation enthalpies per cell, which is going to be the input for the module. Basically, you're gonna to wanna to put in the values here and see what the corrections are for the different functionals. Okay, so I'll give you five minutes to do that and run through it. And then we'll come together and, and go through the exercises together. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Otherwise, I'll mute myself and we'll, we'll give you about five minutes to, uh, to, to walk through those.
All right. Uh, I actually got a, a, a nice uh, private question that I want to share with everyone. Um, so the question was uh, whether. So how do, the, the first question was whether we curate, how do we curate the experimental data um, before we deem it sufficient uh, for comparison? So um, this is a great question. Um, the point is that there are a lot, for a lot of these systems, uh, for the binary systems from which we build the correction scheme, um, there, ex there exists multiple sources of data from which we can do comparisons. And so um, the, there, there are a lot of details about whether we were able to do the comparison and if the comparison exists and, and uh, if, if there are multiple sources and they differ very, very much, then maybe we might throw that data point out. Um, there might be ones where the, date, where the data is more reliable in one source over the other. And so uh, all of these details are provided in this publication. Is it the one, right? Yeah. Yeah, so there's a big section about how we pulled the data, which, which source we deemed reliable, how we perform these, these, um, these comparisons across the multiple sources. Um, but it is important to mention, it's in general, um, they're, they're, we, we were able to, we provide the corrections where it's possible, right? There's not, some, some of these don't, don't have correction schemes because they, there is an experimental data for it. So when the, the experimental data becomes available, then we can build a correction for it. Okay, so let's go through uh, the exercises together. Okay, so the first one, we're gonna grab our, our structure here. I'll plug it in to the web module here, and then I'm going to, yeah, I'll activate it for, activate CC for all functionals, I'll hit submit. And you'll see that, uh, the, well, the question is, what are the, what are the oxidation states that it provides and does it make sense? Okay, so we see that for lead, we get, um, sorry, for lead, we get an oxidation state of plus two. For molybdenum, we get an oxidation state of plus six. And for oxygen, we get minus two. Well, oxygen makes sense. But what about the difference between molybdenum and, and lead? Well, the point here is that molybdenum has a lower electronegativity than lead. And so you expect it to have a higher oxidation state. And so this is, this is giving some insight into how the algorithm is making decisions about which uh, cord, which um, oxidation state it's going to assign to which um, to which species? Okay. So uh, second question. We're going to pull our second structure here, and the question is: Which functional has the largest CC correction at room temperature? Hit submit. Okay, so we want to look at the correction. So we want to compare uh, this correction versus this correction and this correction. So you can see that the largest is going to be for uh, LDA. You can see that it's quite large. Okay. So uh, for the local density approximation, um, we got a very large correction for, for, this, for this particular compound. Okay, last question. Grab our structure here. We're going to plug it into the portal here. And then I'm going to go down here because it asked us to feed in the, the pre calculated formation ent enthalpy energies. So here, this is for PBE. We're going to click on that little, little button there. I'm going to plug this, plug this. And I'm going to plug this in here. Okay. I hit submit. And we get our formation enthalpies um, at zero Kelvin. So we want, that's the question. So it's, this is what it is. So we get minus 3.449 for PBE. For LDA, we get minus 3.412. And for scan, minus 3.412. Four one four. Okay, so um, the corrections you can see they're they're not that small. So for the system, the corrections are pretty important. So you can see that um, 
you can see here actually what the you can compare. So you have 63.452 for for zero Kelvin. And and you can compare that. So you can see that you took off about um about five EV per cell, right? So this is this is this correction is going so the corrections are important. Um, and they're going to change, they can change uh, the, the formation enthalpies by as much as a few hundred um, MeV per atom. Okay, so with that, uh, we're, we, we wrap up the presentation, unless anyone has any questions. If there are no more questions, then we can conclude uh, this session. Um, and we'll come back at, so you get a little break, a little more of a break. We'll come back at uh, 3.15 to pick up with the A-Flow ML module uh, presentation given by Dr. Tower. Um, thank you very much for your time, and I, and, and I appreciate it.